Hi, welcome to another lecture on control. In this lecture, we're going to look at pole zero map on the Z plane and also system performance. So, in terms of the content, we'll look at the mapping between the continuous time S plane and the discrete time Z plane. And we'll look at um, pole zeros on the Z plane and system properties and response, and then we'll go over some questions. So in terms of the key learning points, um, after this lecture, I hope you can explain the mapping between the S-plane and the Z-plane and how to map on poles and zeros on more so onto the Z-plane. Explain how the pole location on the Z-plane dictates the system performance and explain how the system gain is determined and how this relates to the final value of the system response. So on this slide, we have the, the S-plane here. So you should be familiar with this. This is a place where we map on poles and zeros. So if we look at the standard form of a second order transfer function where k is the system uh, is the steady state gain or the system gain omega subscript n is the natural frequency and zeta is the damping ratio and what you'll notice if you look at the s plane is you've got um, along here the imaginary axis real axis and the origin here which is zero going away here you, these are your lines of damping ratio for a zero one and then the increase as you go to the real axis what then you have around here is lines of natural frequency and they also increase as you go away so in terms of the example um, here where we've kind of said the the natural frequency is two radians n and the damping ratio is 0 0.6 so if i was to look at this on the s plane um I can effectively work out where my poles are. The poles are the roots of the denominator. So if I had, um, what was it, damping ratio of 0.6, I'd be on this line. Natural frequency of 2 radians a second. So there, that's. And I'd have a, po a pair of complex conjugate poles. And they'd be complex because zeta is less than 1. Okay, so remember. If zeta is equal to 1, you've got a critically damp system. Zeta less than 1, an underdamped system. Okay, and zeta greater than 1, you've got an overdamped system. So in terms of the mapping between the S plane and the Z plane, so the S plane maps on into something known as the unit circle on the Z plane. So you can see this circle here. This is known as a unit circle, and it's because the rate well, unit because the radius of it is 1, or well, the modulus of the radius is 1. So you can see here, um, well, look down here, minus 1 to 1, 0 to 1, and likewise, minus 1 to 0, 0 to 1. And you can see here, in this case, we had a zeta value is e equal to 0, 6, a damping ratio, and you can see how it maps into the Z plane. So you'll see the damping ratio values, 0 0.9, 0 0.8, 0 0.6, 0 0.5, it's decreasing as you go away. The value um, of the zeta value on the unit circle is zero. Okay, and that corresponds to along the imaginary axis here, and you'll have a marginally stable system. So a system that will just continually oscillate. In terms of the natural frequency, lines of natural frequency, it would correspond to this line here when you've got two radians at m. And natural frequency 2 is equal to this and it's a function of the sample interval okay and we'll talk about this a little bit more on it in a few slides time so the effectively the equivalent characteristics of the z-plane are related to those in the s-plane by the following so this um, z here so this time shift operator is equal to this exponential s multiplied by t of s where t of s is a sample interval and just be aware the lines of damping ratio and natural frequency intercept at right angles so in here and in the s plane and the same relationship exists in the z plane this is known as conformal mapping one final thing i think i'm just going to say is that you should recall the s plane is symmetrical about the real axis that property also exists in the z plane and just note that on the z plane here in matlab it denotes a sampling interval t but throughout this um, throughout this course, I use T subscript S for sampling interval. So in terms of um, 
determining the poles and zeros on the z-plane. So here we've got the continuous trans function that we had previously. We've discretized it with a sampling interval of one second. So just to kind of recap you, you'll see here your continuous time system response subject to a unit step input and your discrete model here with a sampling into the watch. Remember, it's the points here that touch the continuous model that we're interested in. So you can see here, um, just using the quadratic formula. So B, B, uh, well, I'm not going to go over the formula. You've seen this formula probably lots of times. So A, B, and C in terms of the coefficients, um, sub them in, and you'll obviously end up with this complex number here, so denoted J. Um, and hence you've got a pair of complex conjugate poles. So if you're looking here on the S plane, on the Z plane, sorry, you can see here minus 0 0.0088 plus 0 0.300011, and then the other one which is at minus 0 0.3011. Okay, so that is using the denominator, as I said, to work out the poles. Um, sorry, but it's from the discrete transfer function to work out the zero. So we use we effectively um, equate this to zero. We well, can equate it to zero, or rearrange it to make um, z z the uh, topic, and then determine what the pole is. Um, the zero, sorry. So in this case, it's z is equal to obviously minus this divided by this, and that will give us there our pole, which is at minus zero point four one five five. One point um, you need to make is that in the S plane, we typically use maybe two to three decimal places. In the Z plane, I'd expect you to use minimum four and maybe up to six. Sometimes in simulation where you can use higher numbers of decimal places, I would expect you to do so. But that's something we'll talk about as we go through these um, lectures. So how do the poles and zeros um, map between the S and the Z plane? So just recall that it's the S plane and the Z plane are symmetrical about the real axis, hence I've only just put I've only put poles if they're complex on the in the top part. Um, so kind of a few things from the S plane, the real poles in the S plane. So here we've got a real pole. They map on as real poles in the Z plane. Complex poles. So here I've got a complex pole. You know, it would be a complex conjugate pair, so you'd have one down here. They map on as complex poles in the z-plane. Um, the s-plane imaginary axis um, maps on to the unit circle. So the imaginary axis here, we've got, it would be a value of 1. Maps onto the unit circle, so the modulus of z is equal to 1. Okay, modulus, because obviously because the modulus of um, z, because it could be minus 1 or 1, okay, is equal to 1. Okay, so modulus, because because this is minus 1 here. Um, the S plane, um, right, half, right half plane, maps onto the outside of the unit circle, uh, the modulus, when the modulus of Z is greater than 1. So effectively, if you recall, this is the left half of your S plane, the right half isn't showing, but if you were to map your poles in the right half, like the green ones shown here, that would result in an unstable system. Okay, a system where the response continues to grow and doesn't ever reach steady state. And that corresponds to a pole um, location in the z-plane um, being greater than 1. So you'd be outside the unit circle. So in terms of what do the system, some typical system responses look like. So I've just spoken about an unstable system. So you can see here where you've got a pole outside the unit circle. And here you've got a system response that does not reach steady state. It's just going to continue to grow. Um, and then various kind of pole locations. So here I'm kind of these two poles here are on 0 0.6 damping ratio. But you'll see that um, this one here maybe is a little bit is a little bit kind of um, the rise time. So the time to kind of first first point in time when it reaches um, the final value of the system is a bit more sluggish. This one's um, a bit quicker, but it's probably it's perhaps got a little bit more overshoot. Okay, and then you can see here, moving over to here, your system response or your system model, I should say, um, as system response to the model has got a bit more oscillation on it. And here, so you can see wherever you locate your poles on the s on the z plane, 
it dictates the system performance. Okay, and it's going to vary in terms of um, some of the system performance criteria that I just spoke of. And I'll briefly recap you of system performance criteria in a, in a couple of minutes. So considering um, the Cartesian form um, of the poles, so we're used to seeing this form that we've just seen. So, you know, when we've got a pair of complex quadrant poles, um, what it's useful to look at is something known as the polar form. And it's useful because, as I've just said, if you've got uh, effectively a radius that's um, less than one, you're going to get a decay in response to a system that reaches steady state. If you've got a radius that's equal to one, you're going to get a sign of like a, a response that continually oscillates. And if it's greater than one, it'll get, you'll get an increase in response. Sometimes when you're looking at poles, you can be a bit, a little bit misled and you can think, oh, I'm in the unit circle. So hence, because I'm, hence I'm stable. So for example, if I give you a pole where um, X was maybe 0 0.9 um, and then plus, I don't know, 0 0.9 again, you might be full thinking, oh, well, X is 0 0.9, so I'm in the unit circle. Um, <clears throat> but because the imaginary part is 0 0.9, your best bet is you're going to be outside the unit circle. So an alternative form, something useful to look at is the polar form, where the Cartesian um, polar mapping is given by this, where the x is effectively r cos theta and the y is r sine theta. And the polar form is effectively given by this. So z is equal to r and then um, effectively angle plus or minus um, theta. So you've probably all seen that equation a million times before, hopefully. Where the polar um, coordinates are given by, so effectively the radius, you determine it's just Pythagoras. So x squared plus y squared, uh, square root of that, I should say. And then the angle is just the inverse tangent, um, y over x. Um, the magnitude of that. So the polar form um, is also represented in this form. So sometimes it might be useful to work out the polar form if you've got the natural frequency and the damping ratio that I showed you uh, that we we looked at, at the beginning of the um, of this lecture. So we've got this exponential, and then I've also got this TS as sampling interval. So if you've got all those properties, you can also work out your radius and your theta, your angle, using those those three properties. So an interesting property to look at is when you change your sampling interval, your pole location changes on the Z plane. Because if you were to look at the boundary here, your lines of natural frequency, you can see you've got, for example, 0 0.1 multiplied by pi over T, where T is the sampling interval, and then 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, etc. So it's people can sometimes get um, they can misunderstand misunderstand uh, that they think that their um, system model is changing as they change the sample interval. The discrete time pole location does change because um, it's a function of the sample interval. However, you've still got exactly the same mathematical representation of the system. <clears throat> so if you've got an example here where you can see we've got this continuous trans function, uh, discretized it um, with a sampling interval of 1. And you can see here I've got another trans function discretized at 0.5 and another one where I've discretized it by 0.05. And what you'll notice is that the um, form of the, all the coefficients of the trans function obviously change. But if you were to then, for example, maybe do where well, you've done, you've done, continuous to discrete or c to d you can do that using matlab you could do c um, d to c and get it back to the continuous time model and you would notice that your 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 mathematical representation is identical and i can also show you this if on these um on these um pole zero maps using matlab and if we're referring back to the the values that are on the boundary so if we consider, for example, the, these are natural frequency, and we'll say it's equal to a multiplied by pi over ts, where a, I'm going to call it like the identifier 
on the Z plane. So for example, um, the natural frequency is equal to 0 0.5 multiplied pi over Ts, where A is equal to 0 0.5. Okay, as I've said down here. So if we're referring back to this trans function, you see here we've got these two poles, and this one has natural frequency is two, so we've done two is equal to a um, multiplied by pi over ts. And what we've done is rearrange this to effectively work out what a is. So if I rearrange this, a is equal to two, because that's that's the natural frequency, multiplied by ts over pi. So you can quickly do the maths and you can work out the value is 0 0.6366. So if you were to go get this pole and follow it down, you would end up there. And you can see 0 0.6, 0 0.7, and it's roughly there. So it's 0 0.6366. And doing exactly the same now for, you can see this here, all I've effectively changed is the sampling interval. And you can see the value I now get is 0 0.3183, which is effectively just half. So we'll go back to this pole and then just go up. You'll see there, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, and it's just above 0 0.3. Okay, so it corresponds to this value. So you can see the pole locations have changed. The natural frequency is still the same, though, and I can promise you the damping ratio value is still the same. So now if I um, now, now I've effectively divided the sampling interval by 10, and now you can see the result from that is obviously divided by 10, and you can see my pole locations changed, although it's not so difficult to see here, but if I was, you would you'd see you effectively had a value of 0 0.0318. Okay, so the point to get is the pole location is a function of sampling interval, but the physical model does not change. So in turn, I briefly mentioned system performance criteria. So for a second order underdamp system, subject to a unit step input, the following um, performance criteria might be useful. So rise time. So rise time is the, the point in time when your system response first reaches the final value of the system. So in this case, it's a value of one. Peak time and period time. So the peak time is the time at which your system reaches its maximum overshoot amplitude. And period time is just the time for one effectively period of the oscillation. Peak overshoot amplitude is just the amplitude of this value what it is, so in this case it's about 1.35, something like that. Set in time within a given percentage. So how long does it take for your system to settle within a given percentage of the final value of the system? So in this case, 5%. And then number of oscillations to reach the settling time. So these, um, if you watch the MATLAB video, you'll see there's a command whereby you can determine these um, based on your continue, I would, I would use your continuous time system signal output. And then kind of another topic just to um, recap you on, so block diagram algebra, and just to kind of re kind of show you kind of the sample data control system, where the sample data control system being a mixture of um, digital um, or discrete time and when we get onto the modeling, or digital is effectively a digital microcontroller computer, and then it's and then you've got continuous time where you're assuming here you've got an analog sensor um, and you've also got a um, your, your system, which is in continuous time, which in practice it obviously is. Um, so what, what it's doing, just to briefly recap you, you're measuring, um, you're measuring obviously some sort, of, some sort of output from the system. You're then sampling that information to, um, sampling the information so you're taking in, in information every sample interval devoted to ts by the use of the sample switch so this is effectively an analog to digital converter what you're doing is you're you've got some predetermined your it's effectively your references your what you desire the system output to be so it could be desired temperature then in the microcontroller you're going to sample and um, you have a sample switch and you're going to sample what your reference is um subtract this summing junction you effectively subtract the measured um, output from the reference and then you get your sampled error that then is fed into the control algorithm um it'll do it'll do some sort of uh, 
calculations and then throw out a control algorithm output. And what happens is you'll use something known as a zero to hold, which in, in practice is, is, is located within the microcontroller and it effectively holds the signal for TS seconds. So it'll hold the control action. So say for example, if your sampling interval was one second, um, what it would do, it would apply that control action for one second and hold it in the zero to hold. So that could correspond to like a, a voltage. And I think it's useful if you watch the end of the um, final video on, well, the video on, sorry, pra practical this week, if you watch that video and you can see kind of the operation of the zero to hold. So in terms of um, modeling, so in the previous video, previous videos, previous lectures, we modeled G of Z. So what we have here is a, is a pure discrete time equivalent. So here we've got G of Z, which um, we are modeling the system with this uh, representation, because what we're gonna do is we're gonna develop, eventually we're gonna develop in a, in a couple of lectures time, a couple of series of lectures time, we're gonna develop C of Z, so the controller. So this is the d pure discrete time equivalent of this. So we're using this effectively to represent this. And you'll see, you'll remember the transfer function form given by that, and then the closed loop um, control system given by this equation here. Something useful to, um, to be aware of and to use is the final value theorem. So what this enables you to do is determine the final value of the system. So in the case of the, the system, in this case, you can see you've got your transient part and then you've got your steady state. So using the final value theorem, so this, this here is it's being subject to a unit step input of the system, you'd be able to determine what the final value of the system is. So i.e. in this case, it's one. You can use it on an open loop or a closed loop feedback control system to determine the final value. And if you do it um, on a feedback control system, what's useful to kind of um, note is what the steady state error SSE is of the system. Okay. The discrete form of the final value theorem is given by this. So the limit of F and N as N approaches infinity is equal to the limit of Z to the minus one of F at X as Z approaches one. So effectively, this is where n is just the number of, um, well, the sequence of samples. So in this case, you can see the sequence of samples as it goes to infinity, your system is effectively going to go into steady state. And that is equal to this, the limit of f of x, um, well, multiply by this, as z approaches 1. Okay, if you remember the final value theorem for the continuous time domain, it was s's um, approach or going to 0. And if you think now, the reason why that is because if you look at the the comparison between the S and the Z plane, along the origin on the S plane, it's zero, and that maps onto the effectively the the unit circle, which has got a value of well, a radius of one. Okay, that's the reason why it becomes one. So what you effectively do when you apply the Vinoff value theorem is you replace all the Zs with one, a value of one. And then you then just simplify and you'll end up with your final value of the system. So what I've got here is an example just to go through some of the, the parts that we've just spoken about. So what I want to do is determine the steady state gain of the following transfer function. So if you remember back to the original, um, if you remember back um, to the start of the video, uh, early on where we had the standard form of a transfer function where we had k on the numerator multiplied by omega m okay that is your system gain Un underneath you had s squared plus 2 multiplied by um, z to multiply by uh, natural frequency s plus omega n squared that's your standard form so note that effectively the, the state state gain is the same as the final value of the system response when subject to a unit step input that's quite important to know that those two are effectively the same. And it's it's kind of obvious because if you have if you would have a gain value of, of zero, say say gain value of 0 0.5, that would actually then correspond to a final value of 0 0.5. Okay, if you're not sure about that, go away and, and do some do some maths. You'll see it for yourself. So based on the discrete transfer function, um, calculate and sketch the following. So poles and zeros on the z plane, polar form on the z plane 
and also the expected response subject to a unit step input and look at the, at the transient and steady state part. So in terms of the final value theorem, I'm going to apply it to this um, transfer function. So you can see the equation that I just went over is given by this. And then where f of x is effectively here, this g of z, this transfer function. So you can see I've just substituted it in. I've then replaced all the z's with 1. You can see here, I've then simplified it and end up with a value of 0 0.6017. And that's quite interesting because earlier I spoke about kind of um, the fact that you need to go up to four to make well four to six decimal places for the, these when you're in the z domain. Well, the original transfer function, which is in the continuous time domain, had a final value of zero point six. So straight away you can see there there's some numerical issues, and that's something that you will expect when you're working in the discrete time domain. You will expect. Um, some issues with numer numerical calculations so don't worry about that too much therefore this is the final value of the system therefore k is equal to this okay and the final value of the system subject to unit spec is obviously equal to that as well using the quadratic formula so using this where a is 1 b is this and then c is this value substitute it in and then you'll work out your poles. In this place, case, the complex conjugate poles, and then work out your zero here. So take the numerator, um, effectively equate, you can equate it here to zero, um, and then just rearrange it so z is the topic, and then you'll end up with this. You've got a pole minus, uh, minus 0 0.9722. So we worked out the poles and zeros. Now if we work out the polar form, so here you can see the radius of the polar form is determined by, in this case, you can see here I've used the notation A and B. Previously I'd used X and Y, so don't get too worried about that. But X, um, if, you, if, if you remember that, that's your real part in your pole. And this part here, which is your B, is the imaginary part. Squ um, square root of that with these squared, you'll end up there with your radius. The angle is determined by this, so theta is equal to the tangent, well, the inverse tangent of opposite over adjacent, which is equal to um, effectively y over y, y over x. Again, I've used slightly different notation here to I used earlier, but don't get too worried about that. And then you end up here with your um, degree, with your answer. It's in degrees, so to convert, uh, sorry, it's in radians. So to convert to degrees, multiply this by one hundred eighty over pi and you'll get the answer here in degrees. Finally, your polar form, then write it down. So your polar form here is, is given by this. And then what I'm going to do now, so for part B, B3, I'm going to now plot the expected system response subject to a unit step input. But the first thing I haven't done is I haven't um, Put the poles and zeros on the z-plane and the polar form of the z-plane. I thought I would leave it until the end. So what I'm doing here is I've sketched the boundary of the unit circle and now I'm just applying the unit circle. Not as easy as it looks um, drawing a circle. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to add the boundaries of the z-plane on. So minus 1, 1 and 1. So because the left half of the S-plane maps into the unit circle, it ends up being quite sensitive, hence the reason to use a higher number of decimal places. I then labelled the imaginary and real axis. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to put just a couple of lines of damping ratio and look up the lines of natural frequency as examples. Okay, because that's, that's effectively where I'm going to map my poles and zeros around that area. I'm uh, sorry, map my poles, my pair of complex conjugate poles that I've just worked out. So I've just put some values on there as, as an example. So just to get into good habits, I've put z, z to 1 and z to 2, where if you remember rightly, z to 1 is less value of a value than z to 2. So z to 2 might be typically, I don't know, um, 0 0.9 and z to 1 could be 0 0.8. There I've just put on the, the pair of complex conjugate poles and I'm just labelling um, in terms of the real 
the value for the real part and I'll also put in a value in terms of the imaginary part. So just remember these are the real part and then it's plus or minus the imaginary part. And then I'm just going to add a bit of colour just to really so the so the poles stand out. And then I'll add the zero at minus zero point nine seven two two. So that's got my poles and zero. So I've done the first part. So I've I've drawn the Z plane and I've put my poles and zeros on. The next part now is to put the polar form on. So you can see there I'm putting the polar form on. My R value I've just denoted that and I put on my theta for the angle. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put them here because I've run out and I've, it's a bit tight in there. So the radius as, you, as we determined was 0 0.9512 and theta, the angle was 5.7296 degrees. And then the final part. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to sketch the expected response objective units to input. So what I've worked out so far, I've worked out I've got complex poles. So I know the system's going to oscillate, it's going to have overshoot because it's an underdamped system. I've also worked out the steady state gain value of the system or, or I could say the final value of the system because I know they're equal. I also know that um, we are potentially putting a unit step input into the system, which unit step input in the time domain has a value of 1. And I know that the final value of the system was 0 0.6. Okay, and the time we're back in the time domain now, so two decimal places is fine. So 0 0.60. So you can see there I've got the final value of the system response. I know we've got a bit of oscillation, and I know that we've put a unit step input. So that is the solution to that question. So now exercise one. This question is very much similar to the first question the example one the only difference is i've changed the transfer function and i've also added this part where using matlab discretize the continuous time system using ts is equal to one to determine g of z so this is just to give you a bit of a recap and to make sure that you're comfortable with discretizing your continuous trans function and then the next two parts are very much similar to the previous question that i just showed you so final value of the system um all the state state gain um, note that they're the same and then determine the poles and zeros polar form put them onto the z-plane and then to sketch the expected system response subject to a unit step input so i hope um you found this video useful um it's this lecture useful and it's um you you feel like it's nice and clear and that you now understand the mapping between the s and the z-plane and details how the poles and zeros on the Z plane how these compare to the S plane and also how the location on the Z plane although we haven't gone into it in a mass in a great amount of detail but that dictates what the system response looks like and you know how to use the final value theorem to an open loop system and potentially to a feedback control system a closed loop um, feedback control system and you uh, we detailed the equation that you would use it's the same process that you would that you would use and you, you for that, you, also you can determine the steady state gain and the final value of the system. And with a, with a feedback control system, you can determine the error. So key learning points. So you should now be able to explain the relationship between the S and the Z plane and how the, the map of the poles and zero, how to map on poles and zeros. You will be able to explain how the pole location on the Z plane dictates system performance and understand the system gain explain the system gain and how this is determined and how this relates to the final value of the system response. So thank you for um, listening. If you have any questions, um, please email me. Thank you.